welcome everyone. I still see some people coming in. Yeah, I can think we can start the webinar now. So welcome everyone again uh, to what is already the final uh, session of the uh, Geography of Sustainability Transition webinar series. My name is Tom Mehler. I'm an assistant professor at uh, Utrecht University. And in this session, we will have a slightly different, uh, more experimental setup because we will have a, a round table, a panel discussion. And also because it's the last session uh, at the end of the uh, webinar, we'll also reflect a bit on the sessions and Christian will also uh, say some words about uh, the geography of uh, sustainability transitions community and how we can go from here. So yeah, I, will, uh, I would like to thank you all for your attendance also again in this session. And as always uh, some practical announcements that you can uh, put more technical questions in the chat and that you can put content related questions in the Q&A and uh, you can also answer in the Q&A. And to introduce the uh, setup for today, so we, we have the panelists, uh, which I'm very grateful that they are here and you can see them already on the screen. And uh, we will start with some question and discussion uh, among the panelists. And uh, afterwards we will then open up uh, for Q&A and more towards the end. And you can also already uh, post questions uh, in the Q&A during, uh, during the discussion. And uh, yeah, because we have a, quite a full agenda, let me just start with the introduction of the topic. Um, so uh, we will talk about mission-oriented innovation policies today. And mission-oriented innovation policies are a booming topic in academia and practice also even in popular media, um, but they have so far uh, been addressed mostly from a national perspective. And in this session, we will critically discuss what an explicitly geographical perspective or missions could bring to the policy table, for example, with regard to regional or multi-scalar missions. And um, well, mostly in response to challenges around climate change, we have seen a resurgence in the recent decade of mission-oriented approaches to policy. And of course, mission-oriented innovation policy is a term used among many others, such as innovation policy for grand challenges or uh, transformative innovation policy. But in this session, we will, uh, we will stick to the term uh, mission-oriented innovation policy. And from a recent OECD uh, report, uh, we will use the definition uh, that mission-oriented policies are a coordinated package of policy and regulatory measures tailored specifically to mobilize science, technology, and innovation in order to address well-defined objectives related to a societal challenge in a defined time frame. And well, we can see that these measures can span different stages of the innovation process and there's a variety of instruments and they can cut across a different fields and sectors and, and disciplines. And then if you look at some examples of missions that have been uh, phrased, then we know the maybe already archetypical example of the, the moon landing. And in terms of the CO2 emission, missions like uh, make the country carbon neutral by, by 2030. And also, uh, there's also, of course, different types of missions, for example, more challenge-based missions, like the implementation of a solution uh, uh, for the care of chronic chronically ill people at home. Um, yeah, so I think that's a, a very brief introduction of the idea of mission-oriented innovation policy. And let me now introduce the uh, panel uh, for the discussion today. So uh, firstly, we have Elisa Arond, uh, who is a research fellow at SEI Latin America in Bogota, Colombia. And her research brings together work on sustainability transitions, grassroots and inclusive innovation and regional science innovation policy, as well as uh, just fossil fuel transitions and uh, the governance of extractive industries. And uh, yeah, we are very happy to have her here on this panel today. And secondly, we have Iris Wansenberg. She is an assistant professor at the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development at Utrecht University. 
And her researchers focus on new forms of research and innovation policy, particularly the governance of mission oriented and regional innovation policies. Then we have Lars Kuhne, and he's a professor in innovation and sustainability transitions at the Moen Center for Innovation and Regional Development in Norway. And he works on a variety of topics among which at the intersection of economic geography and transition and innovation studies. And then uh, let me welcome uh, Philippe Larue, and he's currently working as a policy analyst at the Directorate uh, for Science, Technology and Innovation of the OECD, and he manages the work of the OECD uh, and on the design and implementation of mission-oriented innovation policies. And then finally, uh, we have uh, Sylvia schwag serge and she's a professor at the Department of Economic History of Lund University, and she has spent 20 years designing, implementing, and uh, studying innovation policies, and her recent work focuses on policies for transformation and resilience, and on science, higher education, and international relations. So yeah, I think I'm very happy that you all are here, so all very welcome. And um, then... I think it's uh, it's good to start with the first question uh, yeah, to which you all can uh, can give her uh, a brief answer, and uh, yeah, that would be uh, what what would you think would be the the main added value of a geographical analysis of mission oriented innovation policy? So put differently, what what novel insights could the ge geography of transitions perspective bring to the uh, mission oriented innovation policy table, and Maybe uh, Elisa, you can uh, first answer to this question. Thank you very much, Tone, and uh, thank you all for this organization of this space. It's really an honor to be on the panel with such esteemed uh, experts in the in this field. So, uh, I, I'm a geographer, so I'm biased when I'm thinking about this question. But I'd certainly say a geographical perspective is is, is essential for analyze, both analyzing uh, mission-oriented innovation policy, but also thinking about the design and implementation of these types of policies. Um, of course, uh, geographical perspectives are, are quite diverse and by no means monolithic. Uh, there are many ways of considering what a geographical perspective means, and I think uh, it's worth referring to some of the work of, of the organizers and fellow panelists on this uh, in in this in today's panel. Um, but some of the work on geographical perspectives and sustainability transitions more broadly points out how. Uh, work on sustainability transition often relegates this geographical perspective to thinking about uh, comparative analysis of different locations or just focusing on, um, for example, transitions or how to support mission-based innovation, let's say at the national level in the, in the Netherlands. Um, let's look at these at the city level, let's compare developed and developing countries. And I think uh, as, as these scholars um, like, uh, Lars and uh, Christian and others in, in this series have pointed out, uh, geography is much richer than that. And so besides bringing in a sensitivity to geographical concepts like scale, space, and, and place, uh, or frameworks such as geographical political economy, these can be helpful to understand why a policy has been effective or failed, and also to help identify levers for effective innovation policy. So I uh, if I have another minute, uh, currently work on uh, energy transitions from the perspective of fossil fuel producing regions. And I think if you start to think about what a comprehensive mission oriented innovation policy, and again, emphasizing this is really about an integrated set of policies and programs. Um, if you're thinking about that oriented to supporting just transitions beyond coal in Colombia, for example, a geographical perspective is vital. You have to think about not only tending to this idea of diversity, but, um, and these other categories that I mentioned, scale, space, place, region, but also here in this context, it's really valuable to think about territorial aspects, um, territorial features, historical, political, economic, and uh, other more material aspects into the lens of analysis, which I think really can be key to inform policy design and implementation and understand barriers to change. Um, so I don't know if I'm out of time or have another, <laughs> I can keep going, <laughs> but. 
yeah, you so tell me. I think <laughs> let's for I'll this first there. question uh, pause there and and, All right. and now give we'll come uh, back. Iris uh, uh, the floor for her uh, short first answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Tone, for, for inviting me to this really exciting panel. So I'm very happy to be here, to be here with you. So thanks so much. And I would like to stress also um, the more governance perspective related to geography and related to mission-oriented policies. So I think for me, uh, multiscolarity is really the key term in this sense, because um, yeah, this might sound very obvious for geographers or for people with an affinity in geography, but I think uh, the kind of innovation policy community is not so familiar with this geography perspective and this complexity and multiscalar processes there, right? So, and if we really want to understand mission-oriented policies as a, let's say, coordination device, I think it's not only about thinking about this horizontal line of coordination between policy fields and sectors, but very much also this vertical uh, dimension going down to the local level or tell or yeah, where actually the local level and Elisa said that already is actually the level where most of the social or societal policies are implemented. So if we extend our innovation policy view to societal problems, then we are at the local level very often in terms of implementation, not only in terms of policy formulation. So I think that's, that's very crucial. So, and for me, therefore, there are two reasons why this kind of geographical perspective can, or what it can bring to the table. So on the one hand, policy responsibilities are, I think, much more complex if we address societal problems with innovation policy. Um, when it's not only about innovation or technology push, but when it's really about kind of these grand challenges, so to say societal challenges. Because, and we know from sustainability research that when it's about housing, transport, energy, a lot is done on, on the local level. And learning about the hurdles and challenges at the local level uh, is really necessary also to successfully pursue these missions. And the second reason is um, that we have, um, yeah, we have a variety of problems and we have a variety of so uh, solutions across space. So, and I think the geography of transitional literature is, was very good. And, and also the geography of innovation literature is very good in kind of re reflecting on and also revealing these differences across space in terms of solutions. So how can we kind of facilitate transition processes at the local level in different regions? So there is a lot of variety, but there's also a lot of variety of problems in terms of societal problems. So, so lo localities face very different kind of, yeah, societal problems related to climate change, flooding, aging population, job loss, all these types of societal issues. And there, also here, we, we can have a, a better eye on this variety across regions. So for me, indeed, two, two things. The one is the complexity from local to global, these interactions, local global interactions. And the second one is this variety or variations across space, which I think can really add to the, to the innovation policy debate and, and also to the effectiveness of missions in the end. Thanks, uh, Iris, and also I think already two uh, two clear points that we will uh, pick up later on uh, as well. Uh, Lars, I thank thanks a lot to the organizers for bringing us together and uh, facilitating this uh, discussion on a really important topic. Um, so I, I won't repeat what Iris already said about how missions is basically ignoring multi-level governance. Um, but I also wanted to give some merit uh, to the turn to missions because it has really put directionality um, under attention, um, both in policy and, and in innovation transition analysis. And I think that is something we should really be grateful for, um, given that, for example, in the geography of innovation, a lot of attention has been often more at the sort of rate of innovation rather than directionality. Um, but uh, at the same time, um, missions has become a bit of a policy mobility, a global policy mobility uh, due to that 
popularity and um, it, it invites a bit for fuzzy policy making. Um, and at, at, at worst, it could be a return to a linear model of, of, of innovation. Um, but I think we also should see something sort of productive in, in sort of the fuzziness around, around missions. Um, and I think there again, geography comes in. So as, as Elisa said, geography is a, a very a diverse and heterogeneous field. Um, in my response, I'll focus primarily on the, what the geography of sustainability transitions could add to this. And I think, um, to me, the, um, the immediate sort of uh, candidate would be uh, the notion of experimentation, which also features in sort of the missions uh, discourse and, and sort of recipe, um, because it, on, in part it's about formulating, you know, well-defined uh, top-down um, missions, um, even though you know, to what extent wicked problems can be well defined is, of course, questionable. But then Matsukata writes also a lot about uh, bottom up experimentation, but she, she doesn't really elaborate on that. And I think there, uh, geography of sustainability transitions has a lot to say. Um, we've been looking at experimentation for a few decades, um, not just within sort of the sustainability transitions sort of uh, community itself, but also in the exchanges with, with, with urban theorists and, and urban geographers. And there are important questions then about how to actually organize experimentation. Um, who orchestrates um, mission-directed experimentation? Is that um, done by big corporates in sort of a smart city um, context? Um, or through grassroots organizations, uh, governments that are organizing test sets, there we would find a, a huge sort of geographical variety that is uh, worth unpacking. But also how different, say, you know, as you know, said, spatial com uh, complexities and varieties condition experimentation for missions. Um, how maybe different varieties of capitalism emphasize coordination or competition between experimentation projects. Um, and that is something that we could also look into. And finally, um, questions around how to orchestrate learning um, and scaling of experiments sort of across um, different experiment, experimental uh, projects. And uh, there, I think we would be really well partly revisiting sort of the work on multi-level governance in the EU and work that's been going on under smart specialization but also how uh, city networks um, are increasingly becoming a mechanism for um, sort of inter-experimental learning and how that sort of stacks up to missions. And we really want to acknowledge there also the work of the uh, Swedish um, innovation program, um, Viable Cities, which is really sort of testing um, how experimentation can sort of really be leveraged to missions and not sort of fall victim to also projectification of uh, of experimentation. Thanks. Okay, thanks, uh, Lars. A clear contribution around uh, the notion of experimentations and various uh, streams that have addressed this topic. Um, then I would like to give the word to Philippe. Thank you very much for, for having me in this very interesting panel. Uh, let me start with uh, just a few statements uh, to provide some kind of a context. First, uh, we have to acknowledge that the, uh, you know, the bulk of what we know as mission-oriented innovation policy initiatives as they have been as defined in this uh, OECD report that you mentioned, most of, most of them, like 98% or even maybe more, are at national level. So that means that concretely, they are led by uh, public actors with a, a national mandate. They are open to all actors, uh, respectively of the territories, and they don't have specific applications in specific territories. Uh, in a few cases, there are some regional actors that are represented in some structure of governance, but I, I agree with what has been said before, multi-level governance is in most, uh, is more in, in most of those initiatives is kind of overlooked. Uh, one example is in the Netherlands, the top sectors. I think, I think that in the last revision of the top sectors when it became mission driven, now you have some representatives of the association of the regions or territories that are represented in this, I think the steering committee, but I'm, I'm maybe wrong about the name. Uh, several regions are interested in the concept of mission. They're talking about it. 
I heard, uh, and I will provide some examples maybe uh, maybe a bit later, but the Basque country were interested, uh, Catalonia, we, I will come back to that. Um, but most of the time then, where do these local dimension uh, fit in the mission-oriented innovation policy initiative that we've been looking at? Is that the level of, if, is that when it comes to implementing the missions? As we said, it's a package of initiatives. And here, several of those initiatives can be very territorial. You find, for instance, in an Austrian, uh, uh, mission-oriented policy on, on mobility, you will find some mobility labs that are directly drawing on territorial um, uh, place-based skills and, and, uh, and organization. So what is the added value of this geographical analysis of MIPO? Uh, it will be very, very consistent with what Lars uh, has said. Uh, we, we have to uh, remember that the beauty of this mission-oriented policy concept, according to me, is, is to try to combine the top-down and the bottom-up. And most of the time we focus, everybody focus on the top down just because it's, it's born out of this project to bring back some directionality uh, uh, in, this, uh, in, in the research and innovation policy agenda. So we focus on that, but really it's really where those uh, local uh, dimension and the top down dimension uh, really meet. And so uh, according to me, adding this geographical dimension will ensure that we consider also the bottom up uh, and how do that contribute not only to the implementation, by the way, but also to the formation of direction, how they receive the top-down strategic orientation, et cetera. And the second added value that really derived from that, and I will um, uh, end with that, is that it's, um, if we, if uh, in this perspective on mission-oriented policy, we are forced us to be more concrete and, and to, uh, to pay more attention to the processes, how they unfold, uh, uh, how, uh, who is in and who is out in this, in this process of mission formation and implementation, but also what are the conflicts and the struggles that underpin what we consider as consensual uh, vision a bit too much. And as Lars said, the, uh, this uh, mission thing very much lends itself pretty, pretty easily to buzzwords, fuzzy concepts, so an incantatory statement. So I think that the, uh, the geographical dimension will be very welcome. It's not the only one. Political economy can do that. Sociology can do that as well. But geography is very much welcome to contribute to that. And I would just end just saying it. Uh, it will also be useful for the focus on the scale up of missions, which is really today one of the limit of mission-oriented policy or several mission-oriented policy. And this is key for transition. If you don't scale up, you don't have the transition. You remain at niche management and focus on the demand side. And we'll talk about that a bit later. Thank you very much. Thanks, Philippe. And also this issue you raised of this bottom-up versus top-down, we'll definitely come back to that. And I think also interesting point you make about uh, these fuzzy concepts and maybe the role of the geographer to pause a bit and, and disentangle what is really going on here in terms of these, uh, these concepts. So thanks for that. And then I will uh, I give the word to, uh, to Sylvia. Well, thanks a lot. Um, and I think a lot of interesting things have already been said. Uh, maybe, um, maybe just to build on some of the things that Lars said about, if I understood you correctly, Lars, about, I, I also see, for example, one thing I'd like to start with, I see a risk of a, of a backlash uh, against missions because I think um, it's become sort of a hot topic and every level of governance is, is embracing the concept of missions, but spending too little time on their comparative strengths. And that's where, that's where I think this geographic analysis is super important. And so what you see is that at the EU level, at the national level, at the city level, you know, everybody's designing missions and all they're often very, very similar and reveal far too little understanding of the complementarities between the different levels, the vertical coordination, I think that Iris talked about. So um, I, I think there are some interesting things that could come out in a geographic analysis, just intuitively from having studied a bunch of countries, I feel that you know, the, the local level has clear advantages um, that are not fully recognized or utilized, for example, at the national level or at the supranational level. So the missions that the EU has designed, we know that there are challenges in terms of stakeholder involvement, citizen mobilization. I think that's where cities have a clear advantage. Another thing where cities have clear advantages are in terms of experimentation, in terms of risk taking, being able to balance accountability and agility in a much, I think, more direct way than, for example, a country or the European Commission can do. Um, and also in, in uh, um, achieving a certain level of policy coherence within a city, which is much, which, which we see becomes a real big problem when you go to the national level and perhaps an even bigger problem when you get to the supranational level. On the other hand, like the international and the EU level, 
have other advantages in terms of when it comes to large public investments, for example, that might be necessary, scaling, as Lars mentioned, um, regulations, you know, and, and, and research if that's deemed necessary. So I think there's too little awareness right now in the policymaking community about these complementarities and different strengths and how these different dimensions should fit together. I hear very few policymakers thinking consciously at the national level, for example, about how a mission that a large city is doing could and should be viewed as part of the bigger mission picture. So in that sense, I think the analysis could add a lot. I also think there's a really interesting thing about ambition. Um, so I think the ambition is and should be very different at the different levels, but one should talk more consciously about what kind of ambition should be pursued. So the criticism of the of the EU missions and also, for example, the German high-tech strategy, if you look at their missions, is that they tend to be rather vague, um, that there are actually no clear, clear goals. Um, so the question becomes, you know, what kind of level of ambition should you pursue depending on what level of governance you are operating? So, so I guess my, my answer is, I think there is a clear case to be made for looking more at the different um, levels at which missions could be pursued and how complementarity could be achieved. I, I find that really to be lacking. And I think there is a risk that if that doesn't become more um, enlightened or illuminated, you know, we are creating a lot. Of, I mean, we researchers and policy makers are creating expectations around these missions. And as I think you were saying, Lars, I mean, I can see that already now that there can be a backlash, you know, when we say the war on cancer, but we're not aware of what we can do on different levels. Um, you know, pretty soon people are going to say, you know, what happened to that war on cancer um, and, and what were you actually trying to do and how did you actually uh, achieve anything? So just uh, but uh, I think I would agree with a lot of the other stuff that's been said. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sylvia. Yeah, I think it's I think a, a strong plea for this uh, importance of multi uh, scalarity and coordination between scales. And I also I also like that you already sort of indicated some strengths. For example, with uh, for cities, uh, the the policy coherence, which would be something that would be arranged at the city level, maybe. And then also at the EU level, some sort of larger scale targets and, and other missions. And and maybe I want to talk a bit more about this multi multi scalarity uh, also going uh, uh, going back to to Iris. So we heard about this city level and then the EU level. But can you maybe say a bit more about this coordination and then also something about the regional level, a level that's also been studied a lot in economic geography. So could you maybe say a bit about this regional level and also then again in the context of, of multi scalarity of missions? Yes, of course. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I think um, regarding this multiscalarity, um, the the strengths of the regional level is, I mean, very very similar to the kind of local city level. So the question is indeed, what what is a region compared to what is a city or so? But I think uh, coherence and being close to this kind of to the local dynamics and and having not the kind of national policy silos in a way, but being really closer to the problem can, can be a strong aspect for the, for the, for the local um, level or for the regional level indeed. So for me, it's um, also, if we look at it from a kind of global versus local uh, perspective, um, I think it's a trade-off in a way also between a variety you can achieve at the kind of regional level to go into the, the local regional conditions to have all kinds of different missions. And that other trade-off that was mentioned already by many people is the scaling problem. And I think this trade-off between variety and scale, we, are, we can exploit a bit better um, in terms of uh, facilitating these multi-level interactions. So the question is, what can we do at the at the regional level, or what is, yeah, what can be done there in terms of variety? How can we benefit from having all different types of solutions? But on the other hand, how can we scale that? And that also, I think, very much depends on the problem framing, and that's also something I want to mention here a bit. So I think different regions naturally have different problems and have different problem framings about climate change and how they are affected or what types of solutions they have. 
So the question is indeed how we can mobilize that to make it concrete for the region, but also make it more general for a European level so that different kind of levels can, can interact. Because yeah, in the end you will have um, a problem framing that is more general at the supranational level, because otherwise it's very hard to agree. While a region can have very specific problems and can contribute to this more general problem in very different ways. So I think that's something our, or this interaction is, is very important to consider here on problem framing and solution framing and directionality in that sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this relation between this <coughs> variety and problems and solutions at a regional level. And then Lars, I saw you wanted to react. Yeah, um, I mean, I agree a lot with, with what Iris has said, and I, I really appreciate it. also the, the paper that she wrote together, together with Kuhn on this topic. But um, uh, at the same time, warn against a sort of Eurocentric view here, um, which is very, in a sense, very positive. But we assume policy coherence to be a good thing, and we often also assume it to sort of be in place. Um, but I think we should also there sort of think about the, say, quality of institutions and how that um, conditions, um, you know, the, the extent to which policy coherence um, at a vertical uh, level is, is, is possible. Um, having spent a bit of time down under, um, multi-level governance is, is not necessarily a given. And there you would find that there can also be quite conflictual uh, relationships between different tiers of government. And not necessarily that's a bad thing. Sometimes also, you know, conflicts between local government and federal government, especially in Australia, actually is, 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 is quite productive. And it would be, um, it would be probably disastrous if, if um, local and, and state governments in Australia would follow the federal government in their climate policies. So, um, but uh, just sort of to maybe make us a little bit sort of reflexive of, you know, also that we take some uh, European um, observations for, for granted theoretically about say multi-level governance and how uh, missions are organized um, in that space. Yeah, thanks so last I think a very valuable point on uh, on sort of our own institutional backgrounds and how this sort of influences the way we think about this issue of multiscolarity. And then I want to uh, uh, to pick up on a point that was mentioned previously also already by uh, by Philippe about this sort of uh, top-down versus bottom-up uh, initiatives. And I think traditionally in geography, we see a lot of attentions for this uh, grassroots bottom-up initiatives. We saw it also in the, in the talk of Fiola. And I think uh, this is really a strength of the geographical perspective, also maybe coupled a bit with Lars' uh, focus on experimentation uh, mentioned earlier. But yeah, even if we say that uh, mission-oriented policy is a combination of top-down and sort of bottom-up grassroots, I still often have the impression that it's really more of a top-down concept. So maybe, Philip, you, you can reflect a bit on this question and maybe also on like sort of strategies that would make or would, would incorporate these grassroots initiatives more into all the different elements of, uh, of mission-oriented innovation policies. Yes, thank you. Uh, as I said in the introduction, I think that considering this uh, geographical approach to, uh, to uh, missions uh, would somewhat naturally uh, lead to, uh, to pay more attention to concrete interactions between actors, to uh, uh, their respective roles, their interaction. In fact, trying to get into the black box of what we could call this machinery of, uh, of collective action. That is really one of the added value as I, as I see it, uh, as I mentioned before. Now, it should be, however, be clear today that most of the mission-oriented innovation policy initiative that we, that we can see uh, are mainly uh, ref uh, limited to, the, uh, to technological innovation. You know the, uh, this sentence, uh, well-known sentence from uh, Matsukato saying, uh, you should be neutral to, uh, to uh, you, should, you should pick problems, not, not solutions. Yes, that's true, but as long as those solutions are technological most of the time, 
and they are rather supply push. That doesn't mean that the whole mission agenda has failed. It just means that these, uh, these um, supply push dynamics is very well enshrined in skills, in structures, in organizations, in skills, in habits, et cetera. Still, there are some interesting uh, examples in the area of missions more than in other policies. So that still is an added value. But so there is some interesting examples of how to embed the demand side, how to en embed the gross, grassroots uh, initiative dynamics into, into, uh, into the, I mean, the, the, the implementation of, of missions. Uh, and, and sometimes that is based on, on specific communities. Uh, for me, the most interesting type of mission-oriented policy that succeed in doing that is what I would call the Scandinavian type. I'm not sure that all Scandinavian would like that I put everybody in the same bag, but uh, let's say that Vinova, last you will, I'm sure, forgive me. Uh, but uh, for instance, Vinova in Sweden are very good at doing that. And Sylvia, I'm sure, can, can elaborate uh, on this. They really have this very, and Finland as well, they have this specific way of doing it, you know, where the state have a special role to, role to support the formation of community, specific community of interest uh, in specific challenge areas. And here the state delegates the task of formation of a specific agenda in a challenge area that they have defined. So that is the top down. So this, these actors, they support the emergence of a community and they will define their own strategic agenda. And then the state selects some of them to well, implement, the, uh, to implement this agenda. So could that work in, at the regional level, at more local level? Some initiatives have tried to do that. And I'm here uh, thinking about Catalonia. Catalonia is a very interesting, you may, you may know of what they've been trying to do or they, what they are doing uh, in the context of the revision of their, of their smart specialization strategy where they have specific mechanism to do exactly that. They ba it's based on community. I don't remember exactly, uh, exactly the, the, the name of it. I think it's called PEX. PEX stands for Project for Territorial Specialization and Competitiveness. And here they built on territorial association, local administration to define what they call, again, I'm sorry, uh, they design challenge-driven transformation, transformative chair agendas. So you see that there are a lot of buzzwords always in these uh, things, but still that can hide some interesting uh, initiatives. And what they try to do is really to take this mass specialization strategy where the, the bottom up uh, is prominent, this entrepreneurial discovery process, as we know it, they try to put some directionality in that, some top-down directionality, and that makes it pretty interesting. There are other uh, experimentations, it's pretty local, I mean, it's local, not in the terms of uh, space, but local in terms of, I mean, limited, uh, but uh, it's interesting, and that could be, uh, that could lead to something interesting. One thing that I want, want to say is that I don't believe that missions should be set at, at regional level. That would dilute the concept, that would create some explosion of missions, and in the end, we would end up. But uh, what we have to find is the right way for, again, the local uh, actors, the communities, et cetera, to contribute to the mission, including to the formation of the mission. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I think a, a very clear example of a way in which communities can be engaged, but also a sort of opposition against then setting missions more strategically, maybe at a, at a regional level, as I, as I understand, which I think is, is interesting. And then um, maybe also picking up a bit, uh, going back to the point of Lars about this sort of institutional context, and uh, uh, maybe Elisa, you can also say something about sort of the idea of mission, um, maybe in the context that you're working on in Colombia, and uh, yeah, how 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 mission-oriented innovation policies uh, could be implemented uh, there. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I was reflecting back on the last two questions. Um, of course, I know we have limited time um, for such a such rich questions, but. I think one of the challenges that ties to both thinking about how this, these frameworks get adapted at a regional or local scale or how you engage with grassroots initiatives is they can't be too rigid. And I think this ties back to Sylvia's point and Lars about you know this the way these policies sometimes are adapted or uh, move th through uh, from one policy setting to another. They, they can sometimes get picked up more blindly or, or as a formula, which doesn't necessarily, it, it's the focus is more on the instrument and, and not on the purpose and the, or can lose sight of the purpose and how it needs to be adapted to the, to the context. And I think that applies both for thinking about how it fits in at the regional or local level, but also how it engages with grassroots innovations and different contexts. I think, I'm sorry, grassroots groups or grassroots um, efforts. 
the the idea of leaving space for experimentation requires an agility and a flexibility in the policy, which may be as as was said, I think, by some of the colleagues here, is is uh, there's a tendency away from that, and that that's very hard to do. But I think there's some interesting examples. Um, the there's always also a tension there. I think when you're trying to talk about how you engage with grassroots which may involve social movements and social movements have their different, with different civil society actors, their power asymmetries, there are different, as Edie's mentioned, different uh, framings of what the, what the mission is, is for and perhaps also different capabilities that play into how to engage uh, between grassroots groups and, and policy. And I think there's uh, research uh, we've done with Adrian Smith and Mariana Fresoli and others on grassroots innovation movements. We looked at some of that, these, these different framings that social movements have around innovation, which maybe the state comes from, okay, we need to get water to uh, address a drought uh, solu- you know, problem. And we have a, a solution where the, the social movements are focused on the process and how to come up with a solution that also builds capabilities. And it's about building connections and their different meanings and values and and uh, tied into that, which the policy in, and institutions are not necessarily um, embedded in those same types of values or not, not constructed in, 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 or they have certain rigidities around their structures that makes it obvious, sometimes difficult to interact or engage. So that's something also I think we've come across in the case in Colombia of the um, regionalization uh, of of science and technology policy um, uh, in the last few years, with this attempt to try to support innovation at regional level, oriented towards local priorities, and and this the challenges there of how you you end up with some scalar politics that were brought up as well in terms of of how these that, that has also a history and and uh, a lot of elements that go into it. Um, this question of how can missions be adapted to local regional contexts, I think, uh, and they work in developing countries. I mean, why not at, at some level? I think, uh, you know, it, but there's also, there's a lot of things I want to bring in here, but I think one of the, one of the challenges is when, you know, when you certainly innovations always had this idea, always had a direction, whether it's been explicitly talked about or acknowledged that way. But the idea of this mission-oriented innovation policy, as I understand, is that this direction needs to be in its at its best set collectively, democratically, and strategically. And um, But then what are these missions? Does it mean that uh, should lower income countries only orient their innovation policies around the SDGs? Uh, you know, who decides that? How is that? How are those goals set and who's involved in those conversations? I think Lars brought that up as well. But I think there's also this, you know, constant debates, which I think comes out in the mission oriented uh, conversation as well. You know, where should limited funding around research and innovation be oriented to applied research versus basic research. And what does that mean? Should lower income countries have a space program? Who gets to decide that, you know, when there are unmet basic needs? And there's there's a lot of things which I think are difficult questions and they need to be up for public debate is part of the point. But second aspect I just want to bring in here, I think, you know, innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's developed by real people in real contexts with real challenges, whether you're in Amsterdam or the Galapagos. And I think it's interesting, this premise, just that missions might be adapted to a local or regional context. If you coming back to this grassroots idea, you know, the original missions, <laughs> we might say, are very bottom up experimentations and creative solutions for resolving real challenges that people have come together to, to, to address in a very concrete way at local levels. And so I think this, we've had this, you know, orientation of science and innovation policy uh, to be focused on industrial challenges and industrial contexts or, or grand challenges, but these have very particular local manifestations. And, and um, one of the risks of the missions is it brings this very you know, man to the moon uh, image as a picture of a national or race or a war, um, and, you know, all the, the meanings that are tied to that. And, but if you work in innovation policy in different contexts that are not you know, the midst of the cutting edge high-tech world, uh, 
the orientation of many local actors is already very focused on solving concrete problems, whether it's water, health, livelihoods, energy access, and economic diversification from enclave economies and all this. So I think this, this uh, the challenge, the, the mission-oriented innovation policy as this national framework, I think, uh, has this challenge of how to engage with these existing um, Diverse contexts, as Iri said, and but also existing efforts um, at local levels, and not just get stuck on on the international orientation and what is a mission oriented, you know, checkbox. What does this look like? What should it include? Um, so yeah, sorry, I think I talked for a while. <laughs> Thanks. I want to, Sylvia. Did you want to react to this? I. I... Get yeah, started. yeah. I think again, a ton of interesting things have been said, and and their last point there that Elisa made about, I, I do think that there is a real challenge um, for mission oriented policy, and I think Philippe was talking about that too. For mission oriented policy at the national level to um, effectively engage with what, with what's going on at city level, for example, there there is a lot of unresolved tensions there, and it has to do with what Lars said: institutional context, national context, and for example, the whole thing about experimentation is really interesting because. We do see several countries where, you know, they keep on talking about experimentation and they're also encouraging experimentation, but they actually don't know what to do with the results of the experiments, right? So um, if you have different cities experimenting with different missions, you know, politically, how do you actually reward one city that is perceived to be more successful than other cities? You know, you have very significant barriers there in actually successfully scaling things not just across communities, but also, you know, at a national level when you see that something works at a city level. So I think these are things that are discussed not often enough. Um, I, and I also just want to talk about one of the things in the chat. There were two things brought up. One is that are different sectors useful? Um, you know, and do they are different? You know, is it does it make more sense? I think if I understand the question to do certain uh, themes at a, at a different governance level. And I think what I would say absolutely. And again, it has a lot to do with institu institutional and national context. But I think, again, coming back to what most of you have already said, I, I, I see sort of a lack of awareness about these comparative strengths and weaknesses. You know, what, what theme is most suitable for the national level? What is What theme is more suitable for for a local level. And, and then the other question that came in the chat with, with Philippe's re reference to Vinova or to the Scandinavian countries. I mean, I think that one of the things that Vinova was quite successful at is that it began very early with a challenge oriented innovation of which missions are only one subgroup, right? I mean, and, and it, it focused on problems and problem owners. And a lot of these problem owners were the municipalities. Um, so that was where they, they were quite early. But having said that, I think also Vinova and the Scandinavian countries are struggling again with, you see all this experimentation and missions going on at city level, but what are you actually gonna do at a national level? You know, are, are you, do you have the mandate? Do you have, Vinova often doesn't have the mandate or the power over regulations to, to act upon things that it sees are working or not working. So I think these are things that are all need to be brought more to the forefront if we want to have a credible discussion about what missions can accomplish and what they can't accomplish, because because otherwise, as I always say, my concern is that, you know, we're going to face a lot of backlash from people who think we should just leave it all up to markets. And then one other thing we haven't talked about is is competition. You know, what do you you know, how, what can you do at a local level that might create markets, but at the same time doesn't distort them or, or destroy competitive dynamics? And how do you handle serendipity, right? That's another thing we haven't, like what, what do you do with unexpected things that might come out of missions and at what level would you do that? Thanks. Yeah, I think that's also a very interesting point about these sort of maybe not so straightforward outcomes of missions that are of course also an inherent element of innovation processes. And I think it's great you also uh, already referred to some of the questions that were asked in the uh, Q&A. And I would like to ask Christian, uh, who has been keeping an eye on the uh, chat and Q&A, are there some uh, more points there also to uh, pick up on? Well, I think Silvia has done a great job in answering them in one go, basically. I mean, there was some sort of also caution by Lakshmi Pant about the sort of terminology that's used with the mission-oriented sort of innovation policies. It's all somehow related to war-based sort of, um, you know, vocabulary, um, which could create some uneasy associations and maybe also some backlash at some point. So but it's more about vocabulary that's being used. And then there were these two questions about 
you know, whether different sectors need different types of missions, essentially. I think this is a pretty, pretty deep point. And then also one about whether the sort of variety of capitalism in, in, in Sweden, you know, um, and, and the Vinova model could only work in this sort of variety of capitalism. And so you would need other types of missions also for other varieties of capitalism accordingly. But I think Silvia has already covered much of that ground. And if there's any more questions for the audience, uh, from the audience, feel free to post your questions also in the Q&A in the chat uh, now. In the meantime, we could go back to Philippe. You ask, and you wanted to come back to uh, Sylvia's point, I think. It was more coming back to the yes to, to the original question about whether and to what extent those missions should be adapted to the different circumstances at the different levels. I just wanted to come back to the definition or the idea of mission-oriented innovation policy that basically by design those missions are and should be adapted to local or national or, or EU uh, whatever the scale is the the, the specificities of, of that level. The mission is not supposed to pre-exist to the national to the mission-oriented innovation policy. Uh, a mission-oriented policy is some, somewhat a way to create a tailor-made and dedicated space for for actors to to uh, a dedicated space for collective action. So basically, uh, the uh, the different uh, in this space, the different actors that are that are concerned by a specific challenge co-create the mission. They, they set up the, the governance structure with the relevant people around the table, and they are supposed to design intentionally the policy mix that will be able, that will ensure the implementation of the mission. So I would say that by definition, if we follow the, the basic rules of mission-oriented policy, the mission is adapted to the right level. We are also nearing a bit the end already of this uh, session. Um, so um, maybe uh, one of the panelists who still wants to react to this, uh, maybe also uh, a bit more of a closing thought, maybe, Lars? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, Sylvia was already mentioning um, backlash um, and sort of un un unfulfilled promises around missions. Um, I, I think there we should also maybe not be too functionalistic or instrumental about experiments, but as we increasingly also see in the literature, um, contestation is also an important element of, of experimentation. And um, earlier today, we was in a, in, in a seminar um, here with some colleagues in Bergen around local resistance um, against you know, government um, plans to uh, quite, massively roll out public transport. Um, so that just brings me to, you know, the, the question also whether missions create a risk of creating a, a, a democratic deficit. Um, so, I mean, we've already talked a lot about, you know, the importance of multi-level governance. And um, I think what, where, for example, the local really figures is around, you know, being a space also to contest missions. And, and not just sort of that everybody rallies behind the flag of, of a mission. Uh, and, and there, I think we are also a little bit in, a, in an interesting space with regard to sort of, you know, what, what are the takeaways from sustainability transitions and with regards to governance? Uh, I think there the jury is a bit out also, because on the one hand, you have a, a lot of, you know, work that sort of advocates a, quite a managerial approach to, to governing transitions. And then you have, and there I think your geographers have made a lot of contributions, um, um, other voices that much more stress sort of the importance of, you know, power, social justice, um, gender intersectionality, um, not always maybe with a clear sort of, you know, policy, you know, toolbox, but, but emphasizing that, you know, uh, conflict, disruption, uh, contestation are also inherent elements of transitions and of missions. Um, and I think they're really sort of the, the local is really that space where that democratic conversation, that democratic struggle is happening. And that needs to then also be sort of fed back um, to 
national levels, because at the local level, I think the chances of those struggles and contestations to be resolved in productive ways are greater than at a national level, where things easily end up into, say, you know, um, party politics, uh, populist sort of, you know, reflexes, polarization of the academic, of the polit political debate. So I think, you know, sort of democratic pragmatism works better at the local level, and that's why we need the local level also for contesting and, um, you know, collaborating around missions. Yeah, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thanks again, Lars. I think a valuable point as well. Um, so, yeah, I think with that, we have already reached the end of the roundtable. Um, and um, yeah, maybe some some points that I took from this discussion, which obviously do not do right at all to this discussion. But I think one of the interesting things that the, that the geography of discussion could do is firstly this unpack this directionality. So how is this directionality constructed at different levels? And how does this uh, process go? So I think that's that's definitely something that came up today. Uh, another issue is, of course, the issue of multi-level governance. What is done best at which level? The strategic element. Uh, where should it be? And uh, and how should these different elements be coordinated across scales? So secondly, this issue of multi-scalarity, I really took from this discussion. And then the third point is really the, the focus on the bottom up. So the experimentation and the grassroots where, where GeoST has traditionally been strong. And then also some examples mentioned by Philip, for example, about the Scandinavian model that maybe could combine this grassroots a bit more or include it. Uh, so third point is this, this sort of uh, experimentation grassroots is I think very valuable. And I think as a fourth point indeed was, uh, was uh, Lars was mentioning, uh, the idea of, of backlash against missions and democratic accountability and maybe all kind of new injustices and inequalities that are, are introduced by missions and from which a geographical perspective might be quite useful to, to investigate uh, these. Um, yeah, so on that note, I would like to, to end this session. And I, yeah, I would really like to thank all the participants here in the panel, but also the audience for asking the questions. And I think we have not been able to uh, uh, address all of them uh, now, but I, I will also encourage you all to follow up with each other and to uh, continue this discussion. And uh, sadly, there's no drinks, but there's emails and chats and whatever. And we can, yeah, we, this is really developing topic. So really don't hesitate to get in touch with each other about this. So uh, yeah, that's something I want to encourage. And then I want to hand over to Christian, at least for bringing up the slides. Can, can you see this already? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, so we want to take just two or three minutes at the end to just wrap up. This is the end of the second webinar sort of series. And just to give you some sort of, um, you know, sort of overview of, you know, what we also want to do in, in the next steps. And but first also to thank, you know, everybody who was involved in organizing and setting up this webinar series. It's always much more work than what it looks like to, to set this up. And so that's, that's the first thing we actually want to do very quickly at the end. And I guess, Tun, you can take over. Yeah, so indeed, thanks a lot to Jonas. So you don't see him now, but he's doing a lot of technical work also now in the background. So so thanks a lot. Geisa also for all the communication and Adrian also for <coughs> administrative uh, tasks. And yeah, so it was really a great team to, uh, to work with. And also, of course, thanks to Christian uh, uh, for being part of the team again for even organizing a seminar series for a second time is I think a great achievement in itself and then um, yeah also to Sean, Jop uh, and uh, for moderating uh, the session and also uh, to Christina and other members of the uh, GRST and uh, STRN group who have been uh, quite active in the background as well so thank you all for that and of course, also thanks to all our speakers uh, today and from the other sessions and to the discussions discussions, and also to you uh, yeah, for the great questions. And in, yeah, we got really a lot of questions in, in quite some sessions. So we're very happy for this, uh, for this active uh, participation. And then, of course, as a geography webinar, we have some nice slides on the geograph geography and I don't really have a lot of time to go over this. 
it's uh, you could summarize it as people from the UK are really interested in justice, and uh, uh, well, also quite some uh, people from Germany are more interested in industries. Uh, but then there's also quite some participation from outside of Europe, which we're very happy with. And it also differs quite a bit from, according to session also, participation from the US differs quite a bit according to session. So that's quite interesting to see these sort of geographical dynamics of the field and uh, at least the, the people who attended our webinars. So again, also thanks to people for, uh, yeah, from all these different countries for, uh, for attending. Yes, and then maybe two minutes for the next steps, right? So another question is now after the second webinar, what, what do we do next and uh, where do we go from here? So I guess there's three direct follow-ups from this uh, initiative. So first of all, we will need some time to synthesize no insights from these webinars. So one thing we're working on is a commentary on the first webinar series, where we reflect on sort of key issues that were raised about the geography of transitions in this uh, first series. And then we will use the second webinar series um, as an input to also frame the sort of next discussion, which we want to have in a, you know, ideally world, real world setting at the IST conference in Karlsruhe in October, on October 5th to 8th. So we have submitted three different, um, you know, special session proposals to that conference, where we, which would give us a chance to continue some of the really interesting discussions we have sort of raised in these two uh, series. Uh, one will be sort of a kickoff event also for this uh, thematic group um, in the SRN network, and which gives really space to discuss about what GOST is all about, what the future agenda could look like, and so on. Then we have dialogue session on multiscolarity in transition studies, and one which will look into sustainable, sustainable development and, you know, how it's approached from a GOST perspective. And we will also be launching a working paper series on the geography of innovation and sustainability transitions quite soon. So we will keep you informed when this is up and running and sort of open for submissions. And we also hope that this will be another sort of, you know, forum where we can share sort of um, the most recent research with, with each other and then sort of, um, you know, engage in, in debates and various sort of also sub communities that are forming in this uh, broad sort of field. Uh, we also want to establish a mailing list and we have a Twitter uh, feed. So please also contribute there and share your events and ideas and papers uh, via social media. And also, again, just get in touch if you have ideas for follow-up activities, um, inputs, feedback, really um, looking forward to getting your sort of um, inputs. And also, if you want to engage with the group, then please just uh, shoot, shoot us an email. Yeah, so that's it from my side. Thanks a lot um, for everybody who was involved. Also, Tone, who made a great job in organizing the second webinar series, and to everybody who was involved in today's sessions. And yeah, hope to see you soon in real life again. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you.